So hello everybody, Calimera. Um, even though I've already been introduced, I feel I should introduce myself. So hi there, I'm Leah. Uh, as some of you might know, I'm originally from Greece. How many of you actually speak Greek? Wow! Απλά ήθελα να πω ότι είμαι πάρα πολύ ενθουσιασμένη που επιτέλους κάνω μια ομιλία στην Ελλάδα, στη χώρα που μεγάλωσα. Είναι η δεύτερη φορά που συμβαίνει αυτό. Um, okay, back to English. So, I'm originally from Greece, and specifically from the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian. <laughs> I usually say one of the very few you'll meet, but um, actually in this crowd you might have met other geographically lesbian people. Uh, in other news, I like making stuff. Uh, you might have used some of my work. Okay. So, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group, so if you have any questions about CSS and standards, come find me afterwards. Um, my day job is doing research at MIT uh, about human-computer interaction, and specifically trying to figure out how we can uh, enable people to build apps uh, entirely in HTML without having to learn programming. We released our work a few days ago. You might have heard of it. It's called Mavo. You should check it out. And I've written a book. It has five stars on Amazon. Um, shameless plug here, you should totally read it. Um, anyway, let's move on to more interesting stuff, like CSS variables. So the first ever CSS variable of sorts was current color. How many of you have heard of, color, of current color? OK. Um, so current color always corresponds to the value of the, of the color property, regardless of how it's set. It could be set by an inline style. It could be set by another, another rule, another style sheet. doesn't matter. So as you can see here, if I change the color, the gradient is updated. I can put whatever color I want here, and it just works. Current color came from SVG, uh, and it made its way into normal CSS. So CSS variables are kind of like the extreme generalization of this concept. We, it, they allow us to define any custom property we want, as long as it starts with dash dash. So let's define a color property and give it a value of pink. You call, uh, you call these custom properties with the var function, and you can use that in any property value. And you, as you can see, this works exactly the same way. I can put whatever color I want here. But they're not just limited to colors. I can define my own property about the size of the corners, for instance. Let's call it corners and give it 15 pixels. So I can go here and replace this, this arbitrary 90% with the value of the corners, with 100% minus the value of the corners property. And now, I can just modify the corners property, and it changes the size of this effect. And at this point, you might still not be convinced. Like, why do I need these CSS variables? I have SAS. SAS can do all this. I can define CSS variables in SAS, and they work exactly the same, right? Not quite. The main benefit of CSS variables are that they are dynamic. I don't have to set my corners property here. I can take it and put it in an inline style, and it will still work. I can adjust it, and as you can see, it works exactly the same. And you can imagine that I can do this. Whoa, this is not. How long have I been speaking with like the wrong <laughs> slide there? Um, the slide is being cut off again, like hugely. Oh, wow. Yeah, like half the slide is cut off. I swear there's some code there. <laughs> I'm going to refresh and start all over when we fix the display issues. OK, whoa, still cut off. OK, I think, I think this is OK. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is OK. So. Let's start all over. <laughs> Current color, it looks like this. I can change the color property. And as you can see, color, current color cha uh, in the gradient changes to reflect that. Um, variables are an extreme generalization of this. Let me define the color property that you, held me, you heard me talk about. Um, I call it with the var function. If the slides get cut off again, do say something, like shout or something. Don't, don't just let me speak like this. 
Um, and I could put it in any property value, almost. We'll see some exceptions in the future. Unlike SAS variables, CS, um, native CSS variables cannot be used in property names or selectors or media queries. They can only be used in property values. But as we'll see in this talk, they're still very powerful. So as you can see, I can change this, and it gets reflected. I can define my corners property and use it in here instead of this arbitrary 90%. And as you can see now, I can change the corners property, and the effect is adjusting. And I can even put it in an inline style. And it works. It's a normal CSS property. It works everywhere. So the first takeaway from this talk is that CSS variables work like normal CSS properties. Here I have a very simple structure. It's just two divs. Um, each with a div inside it. The first one has, uh, has a class of block one, the second one has a class of block two. And here I've defined that the outline property always has the value of the outline variable, but I've only defined the outline variable on the first div, the one with block one. Let's go back to the HTML. It's this one. So we, we can notice two things from this. First off, even though the outline, th this outline declaration applies to every div on the page, only these first two divs get an out actually get an outline. The reason is that only these have the outline variable set before you set CSS variables, they have the value initial. So they, basically, this computes to outline initial, which is no outline. But also, there's another interesting thing that we can see here. Even though I've only set the outline variable on block one, it was also inherited by its child, the div inside it. Let me go back to the HTML and remind you. There's a div inside it. It's this small pink div. And it also got an outline. So this is another thing to remember about CSS variables. Not only they function like normal properties, they function like inherited properties. But you can change that. If you don't want them to be inherited, you can just go to the universal selector like this and specify explicitly outline initial. And as you can see, now this canceled inheritance. Of course, we can always manually make it inherit if we want to. Let's say we wanted to apply this to both block one and block two. But in block one, we wanted it to inherit. We could go here and say dash dash outline, inherit. And now it inherits, because it's just a normal CSS property. So the, the keywords that work on every CSS property also work on variables. Initial, inherit, and set, all of those work on variables just as well. So why does this trick work? Why does it work that if we, if we set our variable to initial in the universal selector, then we cancel inheritance? The reason it works is that basically every, um, every declaration that applies directly to an element has higher precedence than declarations that are inherited. So even though the universal selector has a specificity of zero, it still has higher precedence than inherited declarations. So this is the second takeaway. CSS variables are inherited properties, but you can change that. So some of you might be thinking at this point, maybe I can use CSS variables in my image URLs so that I don't have to repeat like the image directory, or maybe I can change the image directory um, and I don't have to change every single image URL. So you start experimenting with using CSS variables as URLs. So when I did this, my first, uh, my first attempt was using an, a, an image variable with the file name. And then I went here and I did something like this. And I noticed that it didn't work. Why doesn't this work? So the thing is, you can't actually concatenate strings like this in CSS. This only works in the content property. It's special case to the content property. It's, no, it's not a CSS-wide thing. Eventually, we're going to get a way to concatenate strings in CSS, maybe a function or something, maybe calc, 
But right now, we have no way to concatenate strings, except in the content property. So this doesn't work. My second attempt was to take this path and put that in the variable as well. And this didn't work either. So why doesn't this work? In this case, it's not a fault in my understanding of CSS. It's actually a bug in CSS. Yes, CSS itself can have bugs. It's not just, it's not just a privilege of browsers. The language itself has bugs. Specs have bugs. So the reason this doesn't work is because URL is one of the oldest CSS functions, probably the oldest. And because it's so old, it has a lot of, it has a, a, a lot of special casing when it's parsed. Be, the, the, because you can use a URL with both a string and an unquoted string, like you can use a URL without quotes in URL, there's a lot of weirdness when URLs are parsed. And for that reason, you can't really use variables in there because first off, the browser tries to parse them as a URL. It, it doesn't understand the var reference in there, but also because it sees that there's a parenthesis in there, it just throws its hands up in the air and says the declaration is invalid. My last attempt was to use a URL function here. And as you can see, that works. Finally, it, it didn't used to work until recently, actually. There was a Chrome bug that prevented this from, uh, from working. Well, it was sort of a Chrome bug, but also it was a bit undefined in the spec, um, how URLs should be handled. But we resolved that, and now it's not an issue anymore, so this finally works. So to recap, we, ca uh, the re we cannot concatenate URLs because of a CSS limitation. We just can't concatenate. We cannot use inside the URL function because of a CSS bug. We can use them in every other function. I mean, I've showed you uh, variables in the radial gradient function in the very first slide but not in the URL function, it's an exception. Eventually, we're gonna get another, another function for URL that works better and accepts variables, but for now, we're stuck with this. And if we use the whole URL and the variable, it works, but it's less useful. <coughs> so the third takeaway is that CSS variables plus URL equals chocolate ice cream. <laughs> some more WTFs, because every CSS feature comes with some. The empty value is invalid. You would expect that. It's not a surprise, right? However, if you set your variable to one space character, that is valid. It's not valid in any other CSS property, but with variables, it's valid, and the value of the variable is one space character. You, uh, those of you who write JavaScript will also notice that if you try to get the computed style of a variable, or in general, the, the value you set on a variable, it will also include all the white space, because that is also part of the, of the value. It's really weird. Also, unlike every other CSS property, variables are case sensitive. Eh. So, so far we've been using the var function with just one argument, which, and it's the most useful argument. This is what you do to, call the value, the, to use the value of the variable. However, it also supports a second argument, a fallback. And you might be wondering, wait a second, CSS has a cascading mechanism. We don't need fallbacks. We already have a fallback mechanism. I'm I, I just used two declarations. Um, and the first declaration is my fallback if the second one's not supported or, in, or invalid or whatever. Yes and no. So your thinking would be correct when it comes to browsers not supporting variables altogether. Indeed, if I have these two declarations and the browser doesn't support variables at all, yes, it will fall back to red. However, what happens if the, if the browser supports variables, but there is no accent color set anywhere? It would be initial. So it would set whatever property you called it, uh, you used it in to initial. And if initial wasn't valid in that place, maybe because you have a shorthand and some other parameters, then you'd be kind of screwed. This is why we have the fallback. So if accent color is initial, as in not set or explicitly set to initial, then it uses that fallback. And of course, if current color is set to an explicit color, you get that color. Now, quiz time. What happens if accent color is set and variables are supported in the browser, but it's set to a nonsensical value, like at least for background, like 42 degrees? Background 42 degrees doesn't mean anything. So what happens in that case? 
How many think it's going to be red? A few. How many think it's going to be orange? A few more. How many think it's going to be something else? Any ideas? It's actually going to be transparent. Because the first declaration has been thrown out by the browser by the time it realizes that 42 degrees is invalid there. So it can't use it. It's just, it, it has forgotten about it already. It, can use, it cannot use the orange fallback because accent color is indeed set. It's not initial. So what can it do? It uses the only value that it knows will always make sense, initial. And this is called that the declaration is invalid at computed value time. This is a new concept that we defined when we defined CSS variables. It didn't exist before, and it was one of the things preventing us from defining variables. So invalid at computed value time means that instead of falling back to previous declarations, the property just goes to initial. So this is your fourth takeaway here. Invalid at computed value time equals initial. Also about those fallbacks, keep in mind just as a, as a tip that they can be other variables, like, if color one's not set, then use color two, and if that's not set, then it, they can be, it can be color three, and if that's not set, you, you, you get the drill. So some of you uh, might be coming from a programming background. How many of you, uh, are, uh, how many of you program, like JavaScript, server-side code, anything? Most of you, okay. So. The imperative mindset is that if we have a size variable, first off, the HTML here is this. It's just two divs. One of them has a class of declarative. The other one doesn't. So I'm thinking, I want this second div to be 1M shorter. So I'm going to go ahead and say size is var size minus 1M. And suddenly, it doesn't work. It stops working altogether. It's, it's as if there's no height at all. I can even change it from like minus 1m to plus 1m. Nothing. What happened here? The thing is, CSS is not a programming language. It's not imperative. It, there is no order of, of, of statements. Everything just is at the same time. So if size is set to 8ms and you try to set it to 9ms, uh, you're basically saying that you want size to be 8ms and 9ms at the same time which is clearly nonsensical. So it's basically, it becomes invalid. So this declaration becomes invalid at computed value time, this one. And what happens when something is invalid at computed value time? It goes to initial. It goes to its initial value, which for variables is indeed the initial keyword. And when variables, uh, so, and since um, size goes to initial, height also goes to initial, which is auto for height. The initial value is different for CSS property. For height, it's auto, which means it adapts to its contents, which is why we, which is why this property is basically ignored now. So the fifth takeaway is that cycles make variables invalid at computed value time, and this is a trivial cycle. I'm using, I'm, 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 I'm setting size based on size, but there could be longer cycles. I could set A based on B and B based on A, things like that. All cycles become invalid at computed value time. Quiz time. Take a look at this code. It's very similar to what you've seen before, just slightly different. Accent color is set to 42 degrees, and then it's also set to itself. And also we have the same background declaration from earlier. It's set to red, and then it's set to the value of accent color with a fallback of orange. How many think the result is going to be red? Excellent. None of you. Yes, indeed, it's not going to be red. How many think it's going to be orange? Not many. How many think it's going to be transparent? Most of you. Nope, it's going to be orange. So the first declaration that sets accent color to 42 degrees is a red herring. It makes no difference because we're overriding it with this one, which is invalid at computed value time. So it doesn't get ignored. It's actually a declaration, but it's equivalent to setting accent color to initial. It's the same thing. If I had typed initial there instead of var accent color, it would be exactly the same. And what happens when variables are initial? We get their fallback. 
which is orange. Of course, if I actually remove this initial declaration, that's when I get transparent. So by removing a useless declaration made me lose my fallback. So I know some of you may be th might be thinking at this point, why is she talking about, browser, about CSS variables? Surely these are not supported anywhere, right? I can't use them in my work. The, wh what is this, like this latest Chrome or something? You might be surprised to find that they're actually supported by every single browser, including Edge, yes, <laughs> as of April. And I, uh, in case you're wondering what these versions actually, how these versions actually translate to market share, I've loaded, whoa. I had loaded, and I'm trying to load again, but nope. This would have been a can I use page about CSS variables, which also, also shows Market share percentages, come on. Really? Okay, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds and then give up. Anyway, this was showing that the market share globally is like something like 85%, and specifically in Greece, it's over 90%. Because uh, when, you, when you go to kind of use, you can select specific countries. So you're lucky. In Greece, the percentage of CSS variable support is actually better than the average. And sure, it's not 100%. I mean, almost nothing is. But there are techniques you can use if extreme perfect browser support is, uh, matters a lot to you. Like maybe you run, maybe you work on a huge website where even 1% market share is important. So at supports comes to the rescue. At supports is a rule. Um, how many of you have used or, or heard or at least heard of modernizer? Most of you, excellent. So at supports is like the native CSS version of modernizer. Instead of having to load a separate library and use weird classes about predefined things, you can test every single, any, any property and value you can think of, including multiple if you want to test like with prefixes. Um, and only apply CSS if this feature is supported or not supported. In this case, when you want to detect CSS variables, using any CSS variable and any value works. So I, I like to use dust dust CSS variables because it kind of reads nice, like at support CSS variables. So that way you can basically special case any CSS you want to only serve it to browsers that do or don't support CSS variables, which gives you a lot of fine-grained support, um, fine-grained behavior. Of course, at supports only helps you with browsers that actually support the at supports rule, but that is a much wider set than browsers that support CSS variables. Another thing to keep in mind for those of you that are coming from programming or SAS is that CSS variables don't exactly work in the way you're used to. So here I have this div that I've sized at 33 um, VW units and the height is 33 VH units. So I want it to be 33 of the viewport horizontally and 33 of the viewport um, vertically. And I'm thinking, what if I wanted to make it 30%? I have to change this in two places. This is not dry, this is not a good idea. I shouldn't have to change things in multiple places. So I think I can have a variable here and define that as 30. And then I can go here, call my variable like this. And then I notice that it doesn't work. Suddenly nothing works. It's as if I haven't specified a width and height. And the reason is that this is actually invalid because the browser sees size as a number and adding a v VW after it doesn't make a difference. It still sees a number and a VW identifier. It doesn't see a length with a unit. You cannot change the actual parsing by <coughs> using variables. Like you cannot change tokens into another type of token. So what the browser sees here is basically this. It's equivalent to this. 
or, or this, you know. It would be the same if you had white space there, which is clearly invalid. So what can you do? Does that mean you cannot actually do what you wanted? Of course not. As, as is common with CSS, there usually is a way to do what you wanted, just very, very verbose. You can use the calc function and multiply one VH with the value of your variable. Now it works. And you can do the same here with VH. And now it works. It's kind of horrible, but it works. Now you might be thinking, I don't like these two calcs. Why? Here's an idea. I can use VH here. And that, that, give, that, make, that helps me get rid of the first calc. And here, I can just divide by one v, VW. It's like primary school math, right? No. As is also common with CSS, what you expect to work doesn't work. So the reason this doesn't work is that you can't actually divide by lengths. You can only divide by numbers in calc. Soon, you will be able to divide by lengths, but not yet. The reason, if you're interested um, in the nitty gritty, the reason you cannot divide by lengths is that when calc was defined, calc was defined much lo uh, long before variables, and there was no concept of invalid at computed value time back then. So we were like, what happens when you're trying to divide by zero? What do we do there? There was nothing we could do, so you can't divide by lengths. So if you have a number, you can convert it to a unit, by, uh, to, to a length, by just multiplying with one of that unit. But if you have a unit, you cannot convert it to a number. There's simply no CSS-based way to convert it to a number. It, you just can't do it. Which brings us to the sixth takeaway. You should use variables for pure data, not CSS values. You can always convert, them to, to convert it to the CSS value you need, but you cannot <coughs> convert it back. So some of you, how many of you have used CSS animations? Most of you, excellent. So here I have a very simple animation. It just goes from yellow to blue, uh, infinitely. And you might be thinking, I have a cool use for variables. I can use them in, in animations. Wouldn't that be cool? So I try to, to do that. I set background color to some VG uh, variable and defining it here. <coughs> you can already see, see I'm breaking my animation. What happened here? There's no smooth animation anymore. It just goes from blue to yellow. The thing is, even though CSS variables are token lists, the browser still pretends it doesn't know how to animate them. Probably because it sees like this, this white space in the beginning and the color afterwards and it doesn't quite know what to do with that. Um, so it's throwing its hands up in the air and it's like, I don't know how to animate this. I'll just do whatever I do with other properties that are not interpolatable. Like if you try to animate display or any, like, any property that is not interpolatable, this is what will happen. The actual quote from the spec is CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, but since the UA has no way to interpret their content, they always use the flips at 50% behavior, which is what we just saw, that is used for any other pair of values that cannot be intelligently interpolated. So the seventh takeaway is that CSS variables plus animations, chocolate ice cream. But there is hope. In the near future, We'll be able to use JavaScript. Yeah, sadly, not CSS. This should really be a CSS thing, but at least that's better than nothing. We'll be able to use um, JavaScript to define uh, metadata for our custom properties, such as what is their syntax? What is their initial value if they're not set? Do they actually inherit so we don't have to do the trick to disable inheritance? However, the browser support for this is quite spotty, and you, you'll see soon why you have a question mark in Chrome. So I'm in Chrome right now, and it supports this function behind a flag. 
And I will try to run it. Once I press this button, it runs this code. So I'm going to try to do that. You're thinking nothing happened, but let's go to the demo again. Whoops. This is what happens right now. This is what happens if you try to call this function while you have, after you have already used a CSS property. I hear it's fixed in Canary, but at least in stable Chrome, this is what you get. Thankfully, I can, re I can just refresh. Of course, then I would have to do it again. But in this case, I'm going to go and run it before I actually use the custom property. And hopefully, it should work. Chrome becomes really unstable after I run this. So you might see random crashes. But don't worry. We can always refresh. OK, so I've run it. Let's try. Fingers crossed. And now I'm going here, I'm setting BG. Ooh, something's happening. <coughs> See? I now got a smooth animation. And soon it won't crash your browser either. <laughs> also, um, of course, transitions have exactly the same behavior. You cannot transition CSS variables unless you've defined them. But here's an interesting thing I noticed a while ago. So I had this transition, uh, something was a certain color, and then uh, on a given pseudo class, in this case, active. So if I click here, I'm pressing the mouse now. <coughs> if I click here, it becomes active, and you get blue. And you see that there's a smooth transition. I could change this to use a variable, not BG, because we've already defined that one, another one. And then I can change that the transition is between two variables. But you, and you can see, even though it's only the variable that's, that's changing now, I'm still getting a smooth transition. What happened? So when I first came across this, I tweeted, huh, so CSS variables don't work in animations, but they work in transitions? What? But it turns out they actually don't. It's a trip. It's a trap. If you restrict your transition to the background variable, you can see that there's no transition anymore. It's actually still the background that's transitioning. See, if I restrict it to the background, you, I still get the nice smooth transition. Th what's actually happening here is that the variable is triggering a change in background. And because background is animatable, you get the smooth transition. So here's another takeaway. CSS variables can still trigger transitions. Now let's go to some common use cases. This is pretty much the most basic component of all times, a button. It has a variation, a pink button. And here's the CSS about it. As you can see, I had to define the, the same color multiple times for the variation. So how can CSS variables help us here? <coughs> Let's try to use a color variable for the main. All right, and there's this hover effect. So let's try to use a, a, a color variable and define our color there. And I'll use this in every place I've defined black here. As you can see, it works exactly the same. You might be thinking, but wait a second, you still have the same amount of code. OK, you can, only, you can change black in one place now, but it hasn't really reduced your amount of code here. But wait a second until we go to the variation. Here we can just get rid of all our theming code and reduce it to just one declaration. And it works exactly the same. And what's more, I don't need to have special classes anymore that override, uh, that override my CSS rules. This is a declaration I could actually just go and put anywhere, even in an inline style or via JavaScript. So basically, now I can have infinite variations. <coughs> and what's, what's more is that this doesn't just offer you less, 
maintainability and less code. It also offers you encapsulation. Now, I don't need to care how you've implemented, how, how you've styled your component so that I can style it. I can style your component without having any clue what you're doing in there and what, how you've styled it. I don't need to look at your CSS to theme your component. I can just use whatever CSS uh, variable you've exposed. So let's say here, for a practical case, you see how when I'm hovering over this button, it's just going to the, the background's just flipping to the other color. What if I wanted a smooth transition there? And not just the kind of transition I would get with the transition property. What if I wanted the, back, the, the border to kind of grow inside the button? So how can I do that? Instead of background, I can just use box shadow with zero offsets, zero blur, and positive spread with this color and inset. And I can get rid of my background declaration. Oh, and I need, and I need a transition. Let's make it one second. And now you can see how it works. So the thing is, if, if, if someone else was styling my component, was theming my component without CSS variables, they would have to know that I made this change. And they would have to change their own code. But now, they don't have to change anything. Because their color declaration still works. They've, they have this blue version of the button, and my change just rolls out to it. They don't have to know anything. So the ninth takeaway is that CSS variables enable theming independent of CSS structure which is something you absolutely cannot do with SAS variables. Another thing is, notice that here I'm setting, the color, uh, I'm setting the color variable to black, which is sort of an initial value. But in the real world, I, 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 that's not a good practice. It's simple here, but it's not a good practice because in the real world, I wouldn't be styling just the button. I would be styling like, dot my button component, whatever. Or if you're, if you're not using BEM or anything and you're using like plain descendant selectors, it could be like dot my container um, white space dot uh, button dot something. And the more, the higher specificity my rule would have, the higher specificity uh, people would need to have to override the variable declaration. So ideally I shouldn't have any color declaration. But then what happens in the default case? I'm not getting anything there because everything, every, the, the variable is, in, is, is initial, everything, everything goes to its initial value, like I get no border. So this is where the fallback comes in. I can just set, let's break this a bit. I can just set the fallback here. And where else? Here, and that works again, and the theming still works. But, isn't this a bit repetitive? I've basically repeated my fallback three times. Sure, I could use a variable for the fallback as well, and then use the variable as the, a variable as the fallback. But then I would end up with really long var declarations in every single place I want to use color. Instead, I can do something else. I can define a new variable, let's call it color D, and give that value to that variable, so that variable has a fallback. And then I can just use color D here. So how is this better than before? You might be thinking, but you still have a color D declaration in your rule. But the thing is, people styling my component do not have to know about color D. They only know about color. And color is not actually set anywhere. So color D is basically sort of the equivalent of a private variable. It's, it's by convention. They can still override it if they want. But in your documentation, or in your style guide, you say it's the color variable that you use for, for theming. And then internally, you use this one that actually has a fallback. So the tenth takeaway is also that default default values are possible by just using another variable. <laughs>
Another uh, good use of CSS variables is responsive design. Often you have to write multiple rules just to change one thing, whereas with variables you can just define one declaration that sets, for example, the gutter in a grid. And let's go out of full screen mode to show you how this works. <coughs> you can see here how it changes. So 11th takeaway, CSS variables make responsive design easier. And now let's go on to some cool use cases after seeing common use cases. Uh, until recently, and probably still, you have to prefix uh, clip path because some browsers only support it with a prefix, namely Safari and older versions of Chrome and so on. So of course, if you have to prefix a lot of properties, you can use auto prefixer or prefix tree or whatever. But what if you, if you only want to prefix one property, you can actually use a workaround with CSS variables. So what I've done here is, I've used the trick to cancel inheritance, as we've seen earlier, because we don't want clip path to inherit. And then I'm setting WebKit clip path and clip path to the value of the clip path variable. So basically I can now use, no, let's say div here. I can now use clip path as if I, I was using the actual clip path property and it works exactly the same. Almost, it's not animatable. But unless, if you're not animating clip path, it basically works exactly the same. Now let's try to use it. Let's do a diamond clip path. So this will, t it will take a while until you start seeing something. 50% horizontally, 100 vertically. There's something happening. And then zero horizontally, 50% vertically. There's our diamond shape. And as you can see, now I'm applying it to all, div, uh, to all divs. Uh, so I, I get a clip path in all divs. I can only apply it to block one. I can apply it to the div inside block one. It works exactly the same. And it's basically setting these two properties. So another takeaway is that CSS variables enable you to set multiple properties at once. Another cool thing I can do with variables, although this is kind of a trivial, not very useful use case, um, you can basically create what I call single property mixins. If you want to pre, if you have if you have a property that takes many arguments, and you want to pre-fill some of them, you can use variables for that. So here I created my own purple shadow property that works exactly the same as box shadow, but it doesn't have a color argument. The color is automatically always Rebecca purple. And it works exactly the same as normal box shadow in every other way. And I can choose which arguments I want to pre-fill. If I want to pre-fill the offsets, so that the only thing I customize with my purple shadow property is the blur, I can do that. So CSS variables let you create single property mixins. We're still not there with multi-property mixins. There used to be an at apply rule that is now abundant. But at least with single property mixins, you're covered. This might remind you of function carrying if you're, right, if you're, if you're a programmer. <laughs> Another cool thing you can do is basically create your own long hands. One of the things I don't like about, about box shadow is that even though it looks like a shorthand, it's actually not. You, there are no separate box shadow something properties. I think there should be, but they're not. And you can fake this with CSS variables. So here, I've, it looks like a lot of code, but this is just canceling inheritance for all of these properties. As you can see, this is something you use a lot. And then it's, specif it's, it's um, setting box shadow based on all these properties, and they all have fallbacks except blur, which means that you will have to absolutely use, to, you have to set box shadow blur to use this. Because um, every CSS shorthand has a property like this, like something that you have to set to see an effect. And in this case, we chose blur. So let's set that to 1M. And you can see I'm already seeing something. And let me set box shadow color to, I don't know, red. And now on hover, 
I'm setting box. Whoa. Hmm. I've seen this bug before. Oh, looks like this worked. Okay. Oof. And then you can set box shadow color to say blue. It's not going to be pretty, but as you can see, it works. It's exactly the, sha the same shadow, and I only had to override box shadow color. So it sort of works like a shorthand. So the, for the, the 14th takeaway is that CSS variables enable you to create your own custom longhands. And here, I'm creating a, a property that I sort of always wanted to have, like a prepend property, where you don't have to write a, 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 CS, a whole CSS rule. You can just use the prepend property and, a, and prepend some text to wherever you want. Let's do it on every div here. As you can see, um, I didn't have to write any generated content uh, rules. Just just use this prepend property as and as I would any other property, or only the inside ones, or just block one. Uh, you see, it doesn't inherit because I cancelled inheritance here. Um, the HTML is exactly the same as all the similar examples we've seen. Um, and you can see how it works here. And of course, just like every other CSS variable, I can go to the inline style here and, well, if I take care of the quotes, yeah, as you can see here, I can use it in the inline style as well. So another takeaway is that CSS variables enable you to, to define your own properties. So some of you, especially those that hand code SVG, how many hand code SVG to some degree? Cool, quite a few. So you might be wondering, can I use CSS variables in there to make things easier? And the answer is yes. So here we have two eyes. Here's the SVG for those two eyes. The important one is the iris here. And I have this CSS rule here that sets the iris uh, the center of the circle uh, that creates the iris to 50 pixels. And yes, these days you can use CSS properties to set even geometrical CSS uh, SVG attributes. And as you can see, if I change this property, the circle moves. But it's kind of arbitrary, like to make the eye look all the way, what is, is it left or right? right? Right. I'm terrible with left or right especially when it's all mirrored in a projector and I have to like think some more about it. Anyway, to make it look that way, it's 25 pixels. To make it look the other way is 75 pixels. It's kind of arbitrary. So I create a variable that goes from zero to one. Let's set it to 0.5. And here I use calc, 25 pixels is the minimum, and then plus 50 pixels multiplied by this variable. And now I can just change this variable and it's a reasonable value. It's, it's a percentage of how much it looks left. All right. So CSS variables plus SVG equals low. What about CSS variables plus JavaScript? I gave you a hint earlier that you can indeed set and get them by JavaScript. There's no new API for this actually. It just uses the same methods that element.style or uh, the elements had for years, for decades. For example, if you want to get the the, a, a variable from the inline style, you just call uh, element.style get property value. If you want to get uh, the computed value of the variable, like the, the value uh, I including like cascading from style sheets and everything, you just get the computed style and you use get property value again. You're probably not very used to get property value uh, because for normal CSS properties, you just use the camel case version, but it exists. You can use it for normal CSS properties as well. And because variables don't have a camel case version, that's the only thing you can use. Uh, and to set it on an, on an inline style, you just use set property. Now, why is it set property and get property value instead of like, I don't know, something consistent like get property? I don't know. The older the API, the less sense it makes. But 
you can basically use these to get and set CSS variables, and you can use any existing CSS OM methods as well. Like all these method th methods that let you modify style sheets and add declarations in style sheets, you can <laughs> use those with variables as well. Like everything works. They're just normal CSS properties. That's the whole point. Nothing new needs to be added and supported by browsers. Just uh, just variables, like no new API, nothing. So what can we do with this? Let's look at some cool examples. We can set two variables based on the mouse position. We only need to set uh, one event listener in the document. And we're setting uh, these variables to like a percentage of how far the mouse has moved, left and right. Um, this is an event uh, on the entire document. Um, I'm setting, uh, I'm getting the, the horizontal and vertical position and percentages, and I'm setting two variables with it. Pretty simple stuff, right? Now, what can we do with that? Here we have a radial gradient where, with uh, its center fixed to the center of the screen, but I can make it more interesting. Instead of 50%, I can say 100% multiplied by the value of the mouse x variable. And now as I'm moving my mouse, the center of the gradient changes. And I can do this with the vertical position as well. And look, now I can move my mouse and the center of the gradient changes. And what's even more important is that this enables a decoupling of JavaScript and CSS that was never possible before. If I want to change my CSS, Let's say like this. I don't, if, if I'm the, the, in the past, if I was the same person that, that's writing the CSS and the JavaScript, great. But if it was a separate person, like a separate developer team that was writing the JavaScript, then I had to go to them and say, actually, I want to make a change. And they're like, gosh, you designers, you always change everything. I hate you. Why do you make my job so hard? Well, none of this anymore. You can just change the CSS completely independent, independent of the logic. You just have the raw logic in the JavaScript, no CSS, and you, and you just use variables in the CSS. And you can reuse variables. Uh, you can set generic variables like this, like mouse X and Y, and you can use them for multiple things. So let's say you have this gradient background, but you can also use them in another place. Here we have this look variable, but I can just change it to mouse X. And now, I can move the eyes with my mouse. And it's exactly the same variable. I had to write no <laughs> new logic for this. Can you show these JavaScript ones once more? Sure. My slides are online, by the way. <laughs> Maybe I should have mentioned this earlier. <laughs> the URL is at the last slide. So another example. How many have wished to have access to the value of an input in CSS so you can use that to style it? Well, with CSS variables, you can with minimal JavaScript. Here, we're iterating over um, all inputs in the page and setting their value um, variable to their current value. And we're also adding an input event handler on the document that catches future changes to the, to the elements. Because the input event bubbles, you can just uh, register it once on the document. Pretty basic stuff. Um, it applies to all inputs on the page. And here, I have a slider. Just a normal slider, just a normal input type equals range. Nothing special, I've styled it a bit. I've used appearance none to cancel its default styling. And well, most of my code examples assume a slightly wider screen. Um, so here we've set the linear gradient. It's fixed at 50%. I can move it by changing the CSS, but I want to move it by changing the slider. How can I do this? I can use calc. So the value goes between 1 and 100. So I multiply 1% with the value. And now, <coughs> as I move the slider, it changes. It's not the prettiest gradient in the world, but you can. Imagine how it would work with a prettier one as well. And the good thing is, if I want to style another slider differently, if I want to style another, another complete, completely different type of input differently, I, I still have the same value variable. Another cool example is sometimes 
Uh, you want to apply certain styling to scrollable containers, maybe a progress bar, how far you've scrolled. You can do this with CSS variables in a tiny bit of JavaScript. In this case, we assume that you've assigned a scrolling class to all these scrolled containers that you want to have this effect on. And then you add a scroll event listener. Um, you calculate how much is the maximum amount of scrolling that you can do on that container and how much you've actually scrolled. And then set a variable with that result, with that ratio. So the variable is basically a, a zero to one percentage between how much you've, uh, how much you've actually scrolled. And I can use it here. Let's first set it to a basic effect, like 100% multiplied by var scroll. And let's see, yes. And the good thing is, now that I've written the, the logic, I can just change the styling as I want. I can go and change the gradient to say a progress bar from red to white with a background size of 100% horizontally and 0.5 amps vertically. And as you can see, my progress bar at the top just works. I, had, I didn't have to make any change to the JavaScript. I can even use it to make completely different effects. Like, let's say I want to set background color to something like Okay, let's say 90% brightness, okay. And then I'm gonna vary, now let's make it big, okay. And now let's vary the hue. And as you can see, now it changes as I scroll. Please don't do this on a real website, but I just <laughs> thought it was cool. So the last takeaway is that CSS variables are basically a revolution for separation of style and behavior. This is, I think, much more important than any of the maintenance benefits. Yes, you could get some of the maintenance benefits with SAS, but the communication they enable between JavaScript and CSS is unprecedented. You, for, for once, you don't need to put CSS in your JavaScript. You don't need to build CSS with JavaScript. You can just set the actual variables, the actual data that changes, and keep your style where it belongs, in the CSS. No need for all this uh, CSS and JS crap. You just, you just write your CSS where it was intended and set whatever variables you need in JavaScript. And this, these could be even written by different people that just communicate based on, this is the, these are the variables I need, Use them in your CSS, that's it. If you're interested in learning more, uh, these are the specifications. Um, the first one is the published ver stable version. The, last the, the second one is the editor's draft, which has the latest changes. Um, like I said, my slides are online. Uh, here's the URL. Uh, a question I often get is, how did I make my slides? You can find that on GitHub as well. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, also, if, you're, uh, if you want Marvel stickers and Code Pirate stickers, I have those two just ask. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ.